to sum up, my conclusion is that it's best not to hunt for an intuitive notion of what entropy is. Now, it is true that entropy has, because of the second law, a unidirectional irrevocable evolution from lower entropy to higher en entropy for a closed system. And again, we can't think of the Earth alone as being a closed system, but you could think of the Earth coupled with the Sun as being pretty close to an isolated system. I should have said isolated system, not, not closed system, isolated system. Uh, I, I've used a double hourglass analogy. Think about an hourglass that has this kind of shape. So there's some sand that's already here, and there's a whole lot of sand up here. Well, I guess I'll call it. And the sand is is dribbling down in this direction. And there's an infinite amount of sand up here. And the you can think of the movement of the sand as being analogous to a flow of entropy. And the flow of entropy means that things are happening, things are changing. If entropy change, if the entropy change is zero, if entropy stops changing, then there's a sense in which nothing happens, at least nothing macroscopically happens anymore. So eventually the solar system is going to run down, the sun is going to run out of fuel, and with this hourglass analogy, that's like this part of the hourglass finally getting all filled up with sand and once it's filled up with sand the sand doesn't flow anymore because there's no place for it to go everything's full of sand and the flow of sand stops and that's like the increase in entropy stopping and then macroscopic change doesn't occur anymore so yes that's going to happen but in terms of any more detailed intuition than that does that really mean that um, natural resources are going to run down or that waste is going to increase? You, th those conclusions you can't make. Uh, in, indeed, um, let, let me just emphasize here that this, this evolution has no inter uh, intuitive interpretation. There's a biologist named Jeffrey Wicken, whom I cite in a paper that I wrote a couple of years ago. A and let me interrupt myself. Uh, I'm spending a lot of time on this subject. I do research in this subject. I mentioned that I wrote a book on Judas Rogan in the 1990s. I've continued to do some research. I uh, wrote an article, I think it was the two years ago or three years ago, in Ecological Economics, uh, which was talking about this. and while the emphasis in that article wasn't the controversies, that's something I'd like to write another article on. It's in the bibliography and in the text also, I do cite some people who agree with me in the, in the way I'm interpreting the history of entropy and its controversies. And uh, this biologist, Jeffrey Wicken, is somebody who I think definitely has the, the right idea he actually views evolution on Earth, biological evolu evolution on Earth, as being an example of entropy increase, uh, which seem, which is, of course, completely opposite of the old-fashioned idea that increasing entropy meant increasing disorder. But uh, Wiccan sees evolution as a way of uh, nature figuring out how to increase the entropy flow, increase the rate at which entropy flows, increase, if you will, the, the rate at which the, the sand goes into this hourglass. This is related to work started in the 1960s by a Nobel Prize winning chemist, Prigozhin, on disequilibrium thermodynamics in which it became clear that systems that produce entropy uh, 
sometimes form highly, highly ordered structures. And non-living systems that produce entropy sometimes form highly ordered structures. And Wiccan sort of takes this idea and applies it even to biological systems. This really turns the notion of increasing entropy equals increasing disorder on its head and shows that that really was not a good intuitive interpretation of entropy. Let me also say uh, that, again, I'm not alone in this. Um, and a retired uh, chemistry professor wrote an influential article in the late 1990s suggesting to people who write freshman chemistry textbooks that they ought to change the way they introduce entropy. Entropy was introduced in this old-fashioned way as being connected to disorder. And he said, you know, we never talk about entropy with our graduate students like that, so we shouldn't be talking about entropy uh, with our freshmen like this. And uh, indeed, there have been quite a few changes in freshman chemistry textbooks in the U.S. since the year 2000 uh, because of that article. The chemist's name is Frank Lambert. So things are beginning to to change, but certainly there are economics texts and texts in the natural uh, physical sciences and biological sciences that still adhere to the 20th century view, the 20th century view that's incorrect, in my opinion, that entropy is related to disorder. Uh, quickly, just to summarize the rest of the things that are in this chapter, page 17 gives a brief overview of what we mean by environmental resources, the natural resource base, like exhaustible and renewable resources, the set of natural goods, like uh, landscape and natural amenities, waste assimilation capacity, and finding the life support system, uh, the clean air that we breathe, clean water that we drink, the uh, kinds of clean soil that we need in order to support agriculture to grow food. Those are the kind of environmental resources that we talk about. Um, page 25 discusses externalities and public goods, which we also discuss in the very beginning of the semester. And um, finally, the book talks about market failure, which we discuss more in Chapter 5, and intervention failure, by which they mean government failure, which the book talks about in Chapter 6.